the front of your head, Mike. <laughs> so, any questions before we begin? Right. So, Martin, Gary, you have uh, ten minutes on the clock. So we should start giving it five and then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and so, very clickbait title because you know everybody needs a clickbait title. Um, so, I suppose the sort of the starting point is. Having not been a consultant, I don't feel like I'm thoroughly experienced in sales, but it does depend. Um, so we're coming at this from a, we're, we're gonna define a little bit what we consider to be feature branching. Some people may have different opinions, and you're wrong. Um, but this is what we consider, when we talk about feature branching, what we're advocating for. This is what we consider to be that. So, do you wanna? Mm, sure, yeah, so uh, feature branching, I'll start with the life cycle, but first of all, it lasts days and not weeks. So uh, you can align your branches to a lot of different things. Uh, the term feature is another overloaded term that's used very often, um, and a feature will often last very, a very long time, probably too long to have a branch um, living alongside it, I would argue. So I personally I often do story branches, so something that will be completed and merged within the length of time of a sprint, nothing longer than that. Um, so we're measuring the, um, the lifetime of these branches in days and certainly not weeks. Um, so the, and the shorter the better really. Um, but they are made of multiple commits, which is uh, a distinction from mainline development, where um, we put multiple commits onto, onto a branch and we won't merge that in until that is complete, considered complete. So that involves um, multiple uh, different gates and, check, and uh, checks and balances that we'll put on that, on that branch. So yeah, I mean, it's, it is about a particular branch working towards that sort of singular goal. Doesn't necessarily mean that that's a single commit. It might be, you know, it might be where, where you end up with. But the idea is to then segregate that line of work that you're doing to give you that option to be able to do those uh, multiple commits, which is something that obviously you miss uh, when we're doing mainline. Mm. Sure. So. <laughs> So, um, why would we not want to commit straight to master? Why would we prefer to commit to branches instead? Um, so, there's a number of reasons. Um, so, we would like to treat, we're basically rolling up a number of commits. We want to commit frequently. That's something that I think we'll, we're going to agree on, hopefully. That we want to commit frequently. Frequent commits are a good thing. But they, and these commits should uh, have some minimal level of testing. That, done locally, so that we can ensure that the, the build some will agree at some point after we've uh, pushed it. But we want to roll up a number of these commits into some logical um, grouping that is aligned to the work we're doing, the topic. Um, and so we want to make sure that we don't interfere with other people that are working on different features, different stories, and have them take our intermediate changes in to leave them into their, into their work. Because everyone's working on, on incomplete things. That yes, the commit may work, it may pass any tests, and it may, it may make a file, but it's not necessarily going straight into, every, it's not ready to go into everyone else's, um, into everyone else's context. So I suppose where that, where that really sort of manifests itself more is in the sort of what I would consider immature applications. So one of the, um, one of the real um, benefits of the straight to master approach is that you are getting continual benefit. But if you're in an immature application without unit tests, without integration tests, uh, where everything is incredibly tightly coupled, you essentially lose all those benefits. So you can't actually release very quickly because you don't know that things are right. So that committing straight to master without any review process, without, um, or even if it's just peer review or uh, pair programming, those sort of things are, you, you lose some of those. Um, what's my train of thought there? Benefits. Benefits. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So when we say mainline is free, it's actually not. What you've actually done is you've actually built all these tests, you've done the, the TDD thing, um, which we can debate another day. Um, but you're doing that from the start. And if you're not doing that, you're actually, you're actually coming into this immature application stage. I think that's probably a debate that needs to be had as to whether, whether we're talking when we're talking about feature branching versus mainline, whether we're talking about brownfield legacy immature applications, or whether we're talking about uh, nice greenfield where we've done founder projects and we have the best intentions in the world, and everything goes swimmingly. Super, yeah, and, and, and so just picking up on that, that everyone um, that does mainline development usually talks about one of the benefits of branching being to isolate features that haven't yet been um, completed. And we can replicate that on mainline by doing feature switching, but feet and putting code switches, if step, into the code um, maybe even surfacing them onto some sort of administrative user interface to turn the features on and off. Um, but that's still a cost, that's something that needs to be developed, the absent, um, absent feature branching, you have to put that code in, in place. So feature branching will give you that ability um, to summarily revert a, a merge commit from that branch if you wanted to turn something off. Um, and out of bounds, code, code reviews are also um, enabled by by feature branch or story branching, and so yes, it would be nice if we could all pair program and can, and um, spend our time improving the, the code together. Perhaps even mobbing as, a, as one big group to pull everyone's knowledge level of the work being done up to the same level. Have a, have that communicated across the group, but that's not always possible. It's not always possible to do pairing. It's not always possible to do mobbing. And it, um, uh, instead, we can delay that, that, um, that code review to the uh, point where the pull request for the, um, for the branch is opened. And that allows us to democratically um, communicate the changes between um, the rest of the team and perhaps even a wider audience to get some better, uh, wider feedback on the changes that have been made. So, and I suppose that the last one there is um, a lot of the idea around um, getting the speed up mainline, uh, mainline development is that you have an experienced team. And you have, it might not be an experienced team, it might, as you say, pair programming where you've got somebody who can really trust to you know about all of the implications that are going to happen from that one line of code that you change. So the idea of having a very mature team that trust each other, that know the platform inside now, and that can really, really move fast using that mainline development where you've got continuous delivery, you've got everything being deployed to live very, very quickly. Um, you are relying then on having a mature team that everybody trusts. So I suppose then that comes on to, well, we've, got the, we've established that there are some benefits to mainlining, there are some benefits to um, feature branching. So is there a way to get sort of a halfway house between the two that you can get some of the benefits out of both of those, maybe not all of them, but we can get some of them. So there is a way. Um, it's something that I've done in the past, um, so sort of mainline without actually committing straight to master. Um, so you can use a pseudo continuous integration uh, methodology around your feature branches where you are. Your build service not building everything. Your build service integrating master into your branch without you even knowing. So it's continually doing those merges. Actually deploying each of those feature branches um, on, in their own right and allowing then things like tester feedback. So you can actually pass an entire feature without having to worry about whether that works in master, whether that works, um, and you can actually deploy that into production. So you can actually be rapidly iterating on features and getting that feedback loop from just from testers, not just from your unit tests and your integration tests. And you get the um, protection from having a nice isolated thing that knows not going to go into production until everybody's happy with it. So, um, I think in conclusion there, um, it isn't black and white, although we were asked to put ourselves into one camp or the other. It's much more of a spectrum as to how much branching. We're not advocating for Git, git flow here, um, with good reason. Um, so, because you can go very far, I'm sure, that into, the, into this, and I'm sure there's use cases for that, but they're not the general case, and I think that's the problem here, that everything's being sold as being 
correct for the general case, and that's I don't think that's necessarily true. I think there's a there's a um, twenty seconds. There is more there is more a case for doing branching in a small way than there is to doing mainline completely. Nice. There we go. Ten seconds. <laughs> 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 that was about that <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. You <laughs> John, Martin, if you would now like to spend five minutes giving rebuttal to that before you then put forward your, your actual case for slides. Okay? Wonderful. So, I've got a few questions, but do you want to go first? Or? Okay, you turn it off now, cool. Oh, yeah, fine. So, there's no examples of why you need branching, right? That's kind of pretty damning. Um, aside from that, so the main argument there for a branching thing is because you're doing testing out dev after development. Um, it's hard to build features, but it's not 1998. Um, the other argument was um, how to ban development. It's actually quite interesting. Um, when you can't talk to the other people, you do tend to want to branch. But when you then have to reintegrate that, it's often easier almost to rewrite it with the developer, like catters. You can, if you time box your catters and review them, that sort of thing, you rapidly discover that actually you can rewrite code far quicker than you can actually analyze it again, which I've always found quite interesting. Um, do, do, also, I've been doing a lot of work at startups for the last sort of six months, and I've found that actually deploying to master and just pushing straight, even without tests, if you actually really looking at your work before it, it's actually pretty safe. Because you were talking about immature applications. That's the very definition of it. I haven't had a chance to do the whole CI thing properly on them. Just point her a master branch. Be really careful that you're okay. Um, so a lot of the arguments come down to some bad slicing of stuff. You need to work very fast, which if you're not slicing quickly, you build an inventory. Yeah, I might just see if you're going to say. I had a couple of questions, so that's okay. So you would like to answer them all? Yeah, I would. Uh, not right there. Not right there. Okay, then. Okay, I'll say. I'll say, yeah, that's it. Just to be yourself. Yeah. Just uh, go up at the end of the question. Um, so you mentioned um, test and feedback. They get to test a feature in its entirety on its own. I would probably argue, if they're testing something that hasn't been merged into the product, they're not testing the product. Once it's merged, surely they need to do that test again. So I had a few questions around that. Don't answer. <laughs> um, so you mentioned a lot about you're worried about your team committing to the product as well. That just says you've got bigger problems than worrying about your source control. You don't trust your team. You don't trust they can do their jobs properly. And they're not testing the work as they go along. I wouldn't be worried about my source control if I was thinking about those things, to be honest. Um, you mentioned as well the length of these branches. Um, you said you didn't want them to last long, but maybe about the length of a sprint. I'm not a big fan of working in sprints, but usually, you know, from experience, that's about a two week period. I wouldn't really want a branch to live about two weeks. Um, again, from experience, a lot can go wrong in two weeks, a lot of fixes going through, a lot of change requirements in those two weeks. I don't want something living that long that I don't know what's going on with, I don't have influence over. I want it. I want to be getting involved really straight away. Also, slicing, right? Yeah, big time. Don't want to take away too many other points. Um, yeah, those are my main rebuttal points. Unless you've got any yeah. more. Um, well, multiple commits before merging because like individual commits have no value. So why release it? You know? Yeah. Sarcasm. I'm done. No single committing. Single committed because pairing is clearly evil, but let it deal with that one a little bit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ten minutes on the clock. Start now. Cool. So our argument, we don't need to try and make fun of their argument with our title. It is what it is. We're talking about trunk-based development. And so, I just realised this isn't controlling that. So what is trunk-based development? 
Obviously, the opposite of everything that they've just been trying to mislead you with. <laughs> the whole team develops on the trunk. Everybody commits often to the trunk. Oh, my notes have gone. So everybody commits to the trunk, all work's done on the trunk, and you commit often. You don't break the build, because you're doing it um, all the way through the day. That's part of your CI pipeline. And because you don't break the build, well, hopefully you don't break the build, you feel that pain. So rather than going off working in your own little environment, you're as part of the team as it should be. Anything goes wrong, quite rightly, you're going to get told off by a sharp edge. Anything else? That's it. Well, so the pain is very important. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes you do break it. That's okay. It's to rapidly have to fix that situation and move on with it. Whoops. So, as I was preparing for this presentation, I started thinking about why I think mainline is the best sort of approach. And all the sort of arguments I kept coming up with, I felt there was a lot of overlap with just XP practice in general. So obviously this isn't about your source control practice, but I think they do merge together. So just taking a few, for example, continuous integration. If you're mer merging or pushing, Every, all the time, every day, that's going through your CI pipeline. You know what your product's up to. You know if you're breaking anything. You know if your test is failing. And I think that is just very, very helpful. A sustainable pace. You're doing it all day, every day. You're not waiting two weeks and bang, loads of work's going in. Tiny incremental pieces are going in all the time. So you can start to get a feel for your pace of how long something's going to take you. Small releases, well, again, same sort of line. You should always be in that workable state. If someone comes to you and says, oh, I need to fix something, that's fine. In the work I've done, I know I've not broken anything else. I'll fix that, it'll go through, not a problem at all. It's, it's also the collective ownership side of it with the main line, because you're all working together on exactly the same code base, you're all releasing at the same point, and if you're not, fully integrated with each other, you know, feel the pain again. Um, the other side of it was, um, I can't remember you said it now, but um, it's about software architecture, always reflecting the communication strategies of the business. When you end up modeling software, you end up basically modeling the communication side of it. Personally, I feel mainline branching is the same thing. If you're going in a branching strategy, you're kind of reflecting the siloing in various areas, and then you're trying to struggle afterwards to do it. With mainland branching, you're all in the same effective conversation at the same time, and it all flows together. Um, you yeah, know, that's a main point there for me, really. No, I agree. Massive amount of planning going into this, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I feel this is a really good analogy of why mainland is the best way to work. John and myself don't actually work together. Um, so we met up the other day, sort of gave each other a brief overview of our main points, how we thought this talk should go. And we decided how we we're gonna put this presentation together. And we chose Google Slides. And I feel that is mainline versus branch development, to be honest. So Google Slides meant we were in constant communication. We were both seeing what each other was doing all the time. John made a small change, I could see that, I could react to that, I reverted it. He <laughs> <laughs> didn't look at it. Whereas if you're using PowerPoint, like these guys did, um, <laughs> <laughs> we both could have gone off on our own tangents. I could have changed the slide, John could have changed the slide. When we had to pull the presentation together, those two slides might have meant nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a discount. It's <laughs> symbolizing on the live switch. Um, but yeah, I, I feel this does symbolise what we were doing, basically. Um, I guess we have those XP principles. We're in constant com communication, we're making small changes, and at any point in time, we both knew, well, it wasn't always ready to go, but it was getting there. So one of the big arguments that I've always faced, in my work at least, when people are arguing for branching strategies, 
is mainly when it comes to the front end. So someone will say, well, we're redesigning our site, we're rebranding. It all has to go at once. You, it's going to take weeks. You have to do a branch for this. And I think one of the good examples of here is Amazon. So this is Amazon, I think. Is that 95 when it first started or something like that? Through the years to now. And I think that's a good example of how you don't need to do a rebrand all in once. If you're thinking you do need to do something all in once, why does the front end, why, why would you suddenly work in that more waterfall way rather than small incremental steps of XP and agile principles normally try and push you towards? Do this in an incremental way. Do things, learn from it, plan your next little bit. But if the marketing people, as they often do, wield the power and you can't do this, which is, I would say, is the ideal, you can still work incrementally. They just might not see the benefits of it yet. So maybe do some pre-factoring, make sure your background colours, your whatever colours, are managed by SAS variables. So you keep working in the background, keep releasing all the time, and then when it comes to pull that final switch, that is a small change in the end. And then you just release that, just as you would anything else. <laughs> so I found this, um, I think it was from TFS's website. Yeah, it looks like that. So like <laughs> and it was sort of saying this is a good way to work. <laughs> and like, full disclosure, <laughs> I've never worked in a branching environment, so this might make perfect sense to everyone here. Well, this diagram appeared when uh, Microsoft first introduced real branching to TFS, I think. That's kind of when it all went in the whole hop. Right. Well, it's still on their website now. Like, <laughs> still sort of pushing this. And I just, I had no idea what was going on here. So compared to that first sort of strategy, where it's a single line, my small brain, I would rather work on a single line. I had no idea what was going on here. I can explain it, it's not that bad. <laughs> I mean, I've spent years working with branching models, right? This is like, this is what I did for a long, long, long time, you know? Like, you got a main sort of trunk thing going on, you kind of branch into 2.0, and that's kind of your main trunk, and then at some point it's probably gone to release free over here, but it's not included, so now you've got five different customers all with customized <coughs> bullshit that doesn't work and you <laughs> desperately scramble to do a hot fix but no one will let you merge back across so you've now got like code over here which you can't move back over but someone's rewriting it over here anyway and then someone decides to merge across six branches but it takes six hours to do your test and like it all blows up on your hand. You're like great, I just wasted another day of my life and I haven't written any code yet. Um, I mean, it's a very negative view of branching, but this is crazy. When you think <laughs> yeah, um, and a real branching argument for me is that I literally have no idea how an enterprise which goes from like, bear in mind this is only two versions here, and you've got six different release versions over a period of 10 years. How do you migrate from this into a mainline branching strategy? Take some serious buy-in. But it's because the processes are whack. You know, companies that have worked in that do this and really do this, they, you know, um, they were one of the places where that was really happy that they got just the regression test for the release down to six months. You know, and like, and you think that like, it's taking a year and a half to get a feature or a defect fixed as a result of it. It's madness. Um, so, you know, enough is enough. I think is where I'm trying to come from on that. Twenty seconds. Cool. Okay, I've been off one point. Final point then. No. Nope. Oh, we didn't. <laughs> I would say branching does have its place if you've got all the problems. So like I was saying on my button, if you can't deploy, deploy quickly, you can't slice your tickets properly, you don't trust your team, yeah, maybe branching might be good. Time. There we go. Be fair. <sighs> okay, thank you very much. Well done, job. Get around to those in a minute. So, uh, five minutes, go. Right. right. Okay, so you brought the snark and the sarcasm nicely. <laughs> um, so, we didn't give any examples because they're all too specific and everyone's situation is very different. Um, 
So examples will probably not stand up, just like those haven't. Um, so um, testing features on their own, um, so you'd go back and regress everything all the time, which is what you're implying, that every time something new gets done, you have to go back and regress everything. No one really does that. So that doesn't stand up. Um, we said multiple times that it was days, not weeks, and we kept saying two weeks. Um, a lot, and no one ever said that. We said today it's not weeks. Um, literally on the on the slide. <laughs> so um, agree with the Conway's all thing though. See, there is some common ground. Um, so some of the slides. Trump. That common thing is not Trump. Uh, yeah. So the um, the front end stuff was speeches as well. You started talking about slicing and agile versus warfall, which isn't the argument. The argument's branching to the main line. So, yeah. I mean, you mentioned small releases. We're not advocating against small releases. Absolutely, absolutely not. There is still a. Um, you, know, you should still be doing small releases. What we're saying is that an individual commit where you've done something that is potentially wrong um, because it's not been through user testing yet. You're actually deploying that to line, and then the next commit, then removing that. So now you've done two releases, one that does it and one that removes it. So that intermediate commits that you're doing actually hurts up your history, makes things misleading. But with a feature branch, you've got the ability to actually think about what that is and how it works, merge that in, and then do your release. So you're still doing those small releases, still keeping with those methodologies. Absolutely. Yeah, they're not mutually exclusive at all. So, and then you brought a TFS. I mean, that's from 2009, we lost it all, man. Um, absolutely not what we would advocate. We, the definitions are absolutely key here, what we're trying to argue for and against. Um, so uh, our kind of argu arguments are all based on logic and context, whereas yours just appears to comedy. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you, you talk about a small conversation, you talk about people being in the same conversation. When you're talking about a, uh, a large application, what it seems that you're advocating for is microservices, and there is an argument to say that that is uh, a small conversation that's happening, a small application with a defined scope. What we're not talking about is microservices. We're not saying that something that has maybe you know, two, four, two, three hundred lines of code, then potentially, yeah, there is a, you know the entire code base that you're working in. When you're talking about something that's 20 to 30 million lines of code that you're working on, then it's a completely different argument. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's all about context, it's all about everyone's specific situation, that there's no one size fits all, I would never say that always branch, and I would never ever say always mainline, I think there's definitely horses for courses here, and um, I don't think you can just fall absolutely, it's the same with any of the tools that we use, any of the processes, language choices, everything. It's all about context, and it's it all depends. Yes. Oh, that's my head. <laughs> <laughs> that's a callback. Yeah. <laughs> you got about a minute left if you want to have anything. I I don't know. I might drop. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I'm going to go back to um, the first question that was asked from the audience. Uh, so I'm going to aim this at you, Gary. Uh, you said, the shorter the branch, the better. You can't get any shorter than no branch. I don't think I said that. I would say that um, it depends what logically you can group them into. If you can group more than one commit, how often do we commit? Because if we commit every day, then that's possibly sufficient. That's one one commit a day. But if you commit every ten minutes, you're not getting anything finished in ten minutes. It's unlikely. If it's aligning to a story, you know, it's unlikely that your stories are so your tab, whatever you, you know, ticket you, you align your work to. If you're getting things done within ten minutes, they're very very granular. Um, so you can just you just end up grouping them logically into something, and then when the, the pull request is ready to merge, you can flatten it all down and push that in, maintain the same sort of linear history, you don't have to have all of that weird history going on um, that they tried to pull out. 
So yeah, I I I, I agree. Look, I'm I'm not going to sit here and absolutely defend the branching. I think that there are times and places where it's useful, just like anything else that we use. <clears throat> Um, John Wattick, do you have anything to add to that point? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just how you guys, really. Like, I mean, I've only met men men I've seen since Christmas, really. And I entered into it on the audience for WTI. And so I've sort of started experimenting, I haven't left it yet, because I've never had a problem with it. And the things like saying that I'm going to say, say once, sort of committing like once a day and stuff like that, well, um, the guys I was working with were trying to commit like every 20 minutes. If they're failing to commit, just check out dot and start again because it seems it's clearly not working. Yeah. As a result, I'm probably committing like actual kind of valuable, like value add, every you know, two hours, so, every two, three hours, and trying to get that volume as well. You know. So you can look at you can look at Martin. Sorry. I thought there was a discussion about that. Welcome questions. <laughs> It just it, it it just comes off as do you even commit, bro? You no, know, you're just you're talking about an echelon of developer that not everyone fits into, and I think that's where the horses for courses comes in. That actually there's a massive massive strats um, like strata of um, different levels of dev for everywhere from the noob that's just graduated, someone who's not even been through a university, but all the way up and hey, look. It, we might as well, you know, we're going to bring in specious arguments. Why not just bring a wide meat and use Git? Well, I, that segues into another question. Um, so this is aimed at John and Martin, who's uh, disappeared. Um, in terms of mainline, how do you deal with the junior or new start where the main knowledge isn't yet good enough? Well, yeah. I'm currently working with two guys who are fresh out of North Coast, so they're good guys, but again, the main knowledge is not like a massive forte. And Pairing, you know, like pair of people, you get them going. They've got like vast amounts of knowledge in areas I don't have, and as a result, we're getting massive amounts done. Like I'm, you know, working with something like mainline fast commits and stuff, and I've produced more code in the last four months than I think I had in the last year put together, you know. Um, and it's about just approach. Practice and working together and talking and communicating and you know encouraging people to properly interrogate and work towards the same goal. I mean, I appreciate it's going off tangent, but it's about yeah, communication of piece of code, you know. Anyway, so okay, uh, Martin, anything too? Yes, I'm just going back to the old points. <laughs> I don't want to you know, go against the moderator. <laughs> Can I ask you the, the last point? A minute. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the, the point where you said, so I'm computing every 20 minutes. And then you said, I'm probably delivering value every two hours. So what you're actually saying there is if you're delivering that six commits that you've delivered zero value, yeah. what they've been committed, built and deployed. Right, right. It, it, if, if I'm not committing 20 minutes, I'm checking out dot, right? I'm just raising the whole stack again. Right, so you're actually committing every, every two hours. Yeah, yeah. Right. It does take time to get that. Okay. So, okay, here's one for you, Ryan Thwaites. Um, if feature branching is for immature teams and apps, then is the plan um, to mature the team and then switch to trunk based development? It's, it's for the team to decide what's going to work for them. I'm a massive advocate for self organizing teams, and it's up to the team to decide what is. Um, what is going to get what is going to get business value in the quickest way? Now, business value isn't necessarily delivering small little increments that deliver no business value. That might not actually be delivering any business value whatsoever to the wider business. So it's up to the team to decide whether they want to move um, over to there, whether they feel comfortable. And yeah, I mean, if that works and that's going to deliver value faster, absolutely. If that's not going to deliver value faster, then no, don't. It's about aligning what you're doing as a developer and as a team towards delivering business value, because at the end of the day, as developers, that's what we're supposed to be doing, is delivering business value. Not coming up with a process that we like to do, it's about delivering business value. If we did 4,000 commits in three days, and delivered zero business value, yes, we yes. shouldn't be paid. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Martin, any counter to that, or anything comments? 
I would say, just for being accused of having a straw man before, doing <laughs> six album commits of no value. Again, similar to my earlier argument, you've got bigger problems than branching or main money. You need to be looking at what value is and how you can best deliver that. But as far as like, the maturity of the team goes, surely you'd want that pick up in pace through the time. Like, if they're working well, would it be two weeks for them to deliver value? Why, why would you wait for, to release something? Why would you say, okay, you can't get that out today. You need to wait for the rest of this thing to be finished, I would say. Okay, not bad. <laughs> 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 so you mentioned two weeks again. We are never advocating for something lasting two weeks. If you can deliver value in a day, deliver value in a day and push it out. What we're not talking about is a single commit going on to master every 20 minutes, every two hours, whatever that is. What, that's not what we're advocating for. What we're advocating for is actually aligning what you're delivering and pushing that as one entity, one logical entity. That might be 20 commits that end up being that feature branch that you've been delivering all day. Take those together, merge those as one thing. Don't actually do all those 20 commits onto master throughout the day because they're not delivering any value. They might be, they might not. But if they're not delivering value, don't commit them. You, John, branch lovers, how do you mitigate <laughs> merge issues? <laughs> I haven't considered how that would sound when I read it. All right. <laughs> what branch Let, Let's start again. <laughs> How do you mitigate against merge issues and how can you ensure merge code is safe without retesting? Why would you retest it? Okay, let's ignore the second part, but how do you mitigate against merge issues? Um, you get people who've done it there with you and go through it if it's non trivial. You know, they should, they, you can't just really like, well, so team good, right? So most of your stuff is covered by tests anyway, pretty much all of it. You know, problem with acceptance tests, maybe. Merge, test, talk to people, find people you're merging with, commit, run the test. Yeah, I've just realised I've asked the wrong person the wrong question. Apologies. Let's, let's pretend that never happened. Uh, <laughs> Gary, how do you mitigate your merge issues? Right, and how so do you sure merge code is safe without retesting? I'll tackle the first part. So, so merge issues, you, when, you, when you do a merge um, on a branch, and then whoever comes in afterwards is going to have to going to have to get the master branch and merge everything and deal with any conflicts. And sure, that's more stuff that's been saved up, but it's all topical. So you, you're in the context of what that branch was when you're merging in, rather than paying for three or four different branches all coming into your stuff, or what, three or four different topics of commit all coming into your branch all at once, all in, coming into your, your change set. So when, when you interleave everything together, like in mainline, then you could end up with three commits coming from some other topic coming straight onto your stuff, and you've got to merge all of that together. And some of that might be intermediate work. It's not considered complete or finished. So why are you having to pay the price for, for merging it there and then? when you can do it all in one contextual group at the end of the middle of the branch. Okay. Uh, anything to come to that? Do you like rebasing? Pardon? Do you like rebasing? Uh, no, not necessarily. Again, context. Okay. If, if, a branch is public, if a branch is public, it's probably should be rebased. Just merge everything from last year. Uh, there was a question of where does each team fall on the uh, subject of merge versus rebase. Uh, why don't we cover that now? So that's more of a problem with mainline in general, right? I mean, I feel, I'm assuming you branch guys are going to cover yourself by saying, I'm going to pick a nice clean point to branch from and then go forward. So I don't worry about this, right? No? No, not necessarily. No, I think with mainline, you do a pull rebase every time you get from. The server and you've got everything in a, in a nice straight line because you can't push anything without being like without putting something on top of master at least that way if you do a pull rebase every time you're putting your new stuff on top of the, all of the changes that have gone in 
And now you have one straight line, which is often an argument for mainline development. So, um, whereas with, with branching, you, you often get, if people by default do no fast forwards, so you end up with this, this spaghetti train track horror, but you can just do a squash commit and a fast forward, and you'll still get that, that um, straight line. Um, so again, it's all about context. It's like there's no one size fits all, and there's trade-offs everywhere. So you do a bit of branching and you're paying a price for doing that and you're gaining, hopefully you're gaining some benefit and you have to assess, is the cost benefit? Are you, are you getting the right amount of benefit for the cost? And if you want to optimise, and that's the whole, surely we can all agree on that, but that's just continuous improvement in a nutshell, is assess everything, question everything. Should you even be doing an agile process? Is what for? Or some other process. I'm going to call on that. Uh, that's massive tangent. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going near that. <laughs> I'm, I'm an advocate for rebasing. Um, so if you are on a feature branch, like I say, single committer, the, the idea of one entity, whether that's a pair working on that feature together, but it is one person committing, but continually rebasing off master to pick up anything that's coming. So locally, you are seeing that. And then you can also mitigate that as well by doing the um, CICD pipelines inside your uh, version control where branches are built, branches are merged, and you are actually doing, you are actually seeing the the output of a merge on every single commit. At, at the risk of causing civil war between <laughs> our eastern city, um, so just explain a bit more about your rebasing because if you, as I understand, if you push something and then you reverse Stop that I'm just and then this. push it again that that's rewriting the history of that branch and anyone else who had that branch has now i mean it's it's trash for yeah so is that where this single commit stuff comes from right. you know obviously yeah you've got to be pragmatic and your contact if there are two people committing then yes you can and then you wait until the end when you actually do those things and curate these feature branches that comes down to what we were discussing before around the idea of intermediate commits being confusing in the history. So I, I did this, and then I did this, and then I reverted this one, and then I added this one, and then, so you look at your history over the day, and it's like, I, I have no idea what happened. Because, you know, he, he did 10 things, and then he reverted three of them, and then added four more. Um, it does, it does. That's why I don't understand why you do it. Um, <laughs> but what, we, what we're talking about with feature branches is curation is looking at what you're actually going to be merging into master to make sure it makes sense when you're looking back at through that history that i merged in these four things that made that feature do you rebase i would argue against rebasing oh, yeah. um why are you looking at your get history so much um <laughs> <laughs> for me the main line is all about that little and often i've done this i've done this i've done this my test is passing my test is passing this is my point in time right now I don't care what's gone before. This idea of I need to go back and look at these commits relate to a feature. I guess it's like a code review for 500 lines compared to a code review for five lines. Which one would you rather look at? Which one are you going to get the most benefit from? 500 lines once a day rather than five lines 200 times a day. I don't want, if something's gone wrong, I don't want to dig through 500 lines. I can't understand that. But you want me, that's the point. Because that 500 lines is actually giving you the output of something that works and has been tested potentially by testers, tested by that person. What you're not seeing is how I went wrong three times before I came to that conclusion that this is the right answer. <laughs> so if you're committing little and often, I'm not good at sharing. If you're committing little and often, every build is going through your CI pipeline. You shouldn't keep working with something's broken. So that tiny commit that broke the bill, I'll go back, I'll look at those five lines that changed, I'll fix it, I'll fix forward. I don't, you don't need to look that far behind. You should always be in that real estate. So why are you rebasing? What are you putting things together for? That would be my argument against rebasing. Well, it's good to be on the branch for days. <laughs> I have a request um, from a member of the audience. Gary, can you please stop being reasonable? I want to see people get angry and fight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> um, Martin Beard, um, for trunk-based developers, how would you deal with fixing a bug in production without deploying any new features? <laughs> to be honest, very easily, because if you're committing all the time to master, 
if someone's you should always be committing things that you'd be happy to go to live. So if some something's gone wrong, right, well I'll just stop what I'm doing. I don't that can go to live right now. I'll just fix this, push it forward, and I'll pick up where I left off. It's there's no issue at all with that, as far as I can see. Sounds like it takes a lot of it, that does take a lot more um, care. You did say at one point that you have to be very careful. I think that's fair comment. Yeah. And I think I think that that is something that you would have you would have to be very careful because um, you can, if you break master, you don't have um, something that represents live. Even if it's a, even if there's too long, it branches master and develop or live and and develop. And live always represents what is currently in life. Then you've got something to, to you've got something to half fix from, for example. And then you can merge that back into development at some point. Aren't bugs just features that are really high cost of delay? Sorry? Bugs are just features that are really high cost of delay? Because the customer expects to see them now. So, prioritise it, slice it in, you get it in and half there. Well, at least start investigating it, right? I, I suppose if I was doing online development, I'd be doing continuous deployment straight to live because I'd be trusting the tests, I'd be trusting all these things. So, to answer that question, and, Opposite side of the assignment. Um, fixing something in production is just a commit. It's like any other commit because that would make it to live to fix the issue. So if I was mainlining, then that would be. Would I do mainlining without doing sort of trench releases? That's. I think that's maybe a discussion to be had. So it's almost easier to do that or fix the live than mainlining, to be honest. Yeah. How would you deal with multiple versions of releases that need to be supported? I'm guessing that's one to us. Uh, we'll aim at our job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say feature flags. I'm also going to say I personally have never actually done this. Um, but I don't see why feature flags can't work. Um, one of the big problems with branching is often it's a side effect of having to deploy to customer systems that are under your direct control, which also generally implies that the config is also under the client's control. And they often have access to people like SQL, so they've already run their little custom bits of SQL on it and completely screw your deployments. And that's why you've got production support. Um, that's not good. So mainline branching often is happy unicorn land where everything's going well, right? And in these sort of situations, it's not a problem. Um, if you don't have control of a lot of those factors, they're very, very difficult times. Um, but what main branch does do is often, and the idea of it is bringing the config back under the control of the development team and not pushing it off into the external vendor effectively. And if you do a control of it, then you can simplify a lot of problems. But if, yeah. I'm going off, but I feel a lot of these problems are actually contractual problems rather than development practice problems. Gary, you pulled the um, most pain face, uh, I think that. Would you like to? I actually read really most of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think I think that there's definitely something in there between the Conway's law um, that you pulled up and then and mainlining and when things are happy and, and you know in the new company, I think when when we're there, then yeah, mainlining does sound like you know I can't see any reason why you wouldn't personally. I'm sorry, um, but. Yes, when you do have some problems, because every every when I'm thinking about writing projects, I'm like, why am I? On one of them, I'm doing mainline, and one of them, I'm doing branching. And I'm trying to think, okay, have I, have I gone crazy? Why am I why am I doing branching? And it is because of a Congress law sort of style problem. I want asynchronous outbound and outbound um, code reviews. That's what I want, and that's what the pull request gives me. It gives me that ability to get everyone to swarm on pull request and look at the, and do a, a, an asynchronous code review where you don't have to have everyone blocked on, because we can't mob, and we're in different time zones, so we can't pair. So it's all, so it, and that's a problem, that's an organizational problem. So solving that organizational problem, you would probably go back to doing mainly. So I think you probably hit on something there. Sorry, was that tangential? <laughs> No, you're just ignoring the, uh, the the request earlier, the feature request, I believe, for more than tears. We went off on branch. <laughs> okay, um, Trump people. What if it's time to go home at the end of the day and uh, the code isn't ready for release? What if you get hit by a bus that evening? Again, bigger problems perhaps, however. Right. Your change should be that small. Anything you've not committed as you leave should be that small and trivial. 
Go ahead. Hey, boss, enjoy yourself. Someone else. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for fun? <laughs> also, don't cross the road in pairs. <laughs> No, I think the, the argument there is again against the doing the mind but without doing continuous delivery. Because if you are and that's gone into production, you'd have found out, you, know, you should be finding out before you leave the office. Because you've committed that small little bit of code and that's all gone all the way to production. And I think this it's the this idea of are we talking about mainlining without every commit making its production? Or are we talking about mainlining with um, trench releases where we do daily releases, hourly releases, whatever, and packing those up into a smaller, um, you know, maybe 10 or 15 commits, and then we go and deploy those. I suppose that's it's a different question, really. If we're talking about putting these together and making a commit out of them. And to be honest, whether it's gone to live or not, I've committed, someone else can pick up if I die. And it's, it's not my problem. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> there's, 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 also, there's also a, a kind of an opportunity, right? When you get to like 35 minutes, 40 minutes before the end of the day, you realise that you're probably not going to add any more onto it. If you try and start some work, it's just not going to work out for you, right? That's actually a really good opportunity to just do something, you know, like have a quick retro or something about the day and like, you know, pick up on some newer stuff. It's, you, know, you don't necessarily have to be like, going right at the end of the day, right? You know, there's lots of other places where you can, well, I don't say that value, I'm gonna, but you know, it's like, you can't fucking say it, it's meaningless. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, <laughs> what is delivering value? Um, is getting feedback that can prevent serious work, rework not valuable? Uh, absolutely, that's one of the reasons why I was advocating the presentation around fixing that problem, that exact problem around feedback in a different way and that allows you the idea of the isolation and basically deploy every feature branch and deploy that in a um, continuous delivery way so every commit onto that feature branch is actually going into a um, not a production environment maybe it's a test or a UAT environment so you're actually closing the loop on feedback not just from a, your tests but you're actually closing it from um, maybe testers who want to they don't have to go and test in production I'm going to read this out verbatim, but I'm not quite sure um, if it's correct. Um, if CI is going to merge master with the branch and then build it, uh, the change has to be saved for master. Why the cost of features? Mm. That's interesting. That's slightly weird. You were saying your thing about trying to merge CI yes. and CD in the end of the end. Yeah. So the, the idea of the feature branch is to, in my opinion, is to be able to provide a, the, the feature itself to an external party who's maybe not able to build the code themselves, not able to deploy the code in their own little machine um, to actually run these tests. And you haven't got a mature enough system to be able to have nice little isolated um, flags that you can have that that user can just see in this test environment. So the idea that you can actually deploy that feature while also making sure that all the faster is merged in at the same time, it, I suppose that kind of keeps you a bit honest. So you should really be doing rebasing when you're on that feature branch before you actually try and push. Just try and make sure that you're up to date from master. Obviously, if you're trying to do this every day, that shouldn't be a lot of, uh, lot of code, but that merge from master just basically keeps you honest. Well, I've just merged into master. Because I'm not confident that it's not going to break anything, or it might be something that in a large system, like I've dealt with in the past, where I always describe it as a well, if, if you've ever tickled the dog behind his ear and it's like, does this? That's some of the systems I've worked on. Um, so you don't actually feel comfortable that that feature that you've just messed with over here hasn't affected something over here. So you actually want some real user feedback before you actually start pushing that stuff. Again, the rebase, you would be pulling from master anyway, most likely before you push, right? Which is kind of what you're describing. If you're on a side branch, and you've got a CI system, which is going to affect the This is my head, so I'm not in place. <laughs> That's exactly what you do normally if you're going to try and keep it. The yeah. merge from master to the branch is optional, so I think it's maintained non optional on the CI. Yeah. The CI will always do it. Yeah, and that, at that point, you're effectively 
doing the process that you would be doing if you're going to push master anyway, but you're just committing the last step, provided all your CI. But I'm not committing to master, therefore it's not going to production. That's the, that's the difference yeah. there, is that yeah. I'm doing something, I've done a, a large maybe 10, 15 commits that make up this feature that I'm not 100% sure that I've done it the right way, so I want some feedback from the testers, I want some feedback from the business, so I want to be able to push it to an environment that I can actually get that feedback from. And the way to do that is if you have, um, you've spent the time, maybe not building the team and the trust in the team, but actually building a, um, a mechanism that allows you to do those things, you can actually speed up development and actually where the point on there was around um, not getting the feedback from the and, and getting that rapid feedback yeah. so you're not yeah, I mean, doing something wrong. A low confidence environment, I think you understand. Uh, but it's not just indicating all but my being my problem was that actually this is just covering over bigger issues that could be addressed. Potentially. Yeah. Okay. So the security's way of making that point as well. The the Twitter feed has devolved into chaos um, <laughs> and, and is rather difficult to follow around now. Um, I believe a number of the questions have been answered uh, tangentially. Um, is there anything else that the audience feel they'd like to revisit that's been interesting that I think we've covered enough depth or that, that hasn't been asked that they feel short? Go on. Can I ask? I don't know if it's been properly covered, but if, if you're branching and you have two separate branches of your master, uh, but they wouldn't merge into each other, you're perpetuating their branches independently. How do you resolve that sort of issue, the integration between two other branches, not just your branch and master? So that would be handled at the point when the second branch is merged. The idea would be that the person who's merging that second branch knows exactly what they've tried to change. What they're not trying to do is merge something from 17 different people. They're trying to merge something that they've been working on that they now have intimate knowledge of everything that they've changed and how that is supposed to work. So when they're merging in that second one, those resolving conflicts should be fairly minimal. But we, I know you're debating the time slice here, but whatever it is, two weeks or whatever it would be, a number of days potentially, your branches. What happens if two of these branches that have been running for the maximum amount of time get merged to the master within five minutes of each other? One goes in, the second comes on and you've got to merge your five days worth of change or whatever it is with another five days worth of change. That's a big integration. Yeah. Sucks if you're the second person. It is a problem. That, that is a problem and it's not, it's not something that's easily solved in my opinion. Because the way I understand continuous integration is it's not a tool or whatever, it's, it's the actors constantly integrating, mm -hmm. doing it more often, that's what continues to avoid big integration problems. Yeah. As in CI on branches, probably isn't CI, right? No. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not no, saying no, that no, it no, is. No, no. I'm saying that there are benefits to using branching, there are benefits to using mainlining, and how do you get the benefits that you're using in mainlining that everybody advocates for, how do you get those while getting protection branches? So the, there's, ad, there's advantages to both, and how can you, you know, how could you get the protections and stuff that you get from branches and pull that into mainline? You know, and that, the answer to that is not the feature flags, the feature flags. But sometimes feature flags are not actually viable, especially when you're talking about intense legacy applications or, um, or you know, brownfield projects, there's actually a massive cost, as we were putting across in the, uh, the start, there's a cost to putting in those feature flags in a lot of places. Some of those are easy, some of those are absolutely really hard. Go on. <laughs> so what happens if you've got the people who are advocating for branching no more than they would uh, a few days, and then you've got the people who think that branches are great, and you should carry on doing them, and then you should only do them for a story, and then it turns into being for spring, and then it turns into doing it for two years? Yeah, it was two years. It was two years. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the whole, um, the, I can't remember who said it, but it's around the, the guilt aspect the, where knowledge is passed down and nobody really understands where that knowledge comes from. So when you, it happens, not, it's not unique to the branching stuff, it happens with code, you know, I, I should use var and I should not use the, um, the actual keyword or why, and then you have to go back and find out why. I mean, you should be going back to but find I'm out why. You should branching make, is because you haven't got enough people to do uh, programming. That's one of the arguments around it. Isn't that showing that 
it's not that you don't have enough people to do pair programming, it's sometimes that um, the experience levels of the people who, um, the availability of people might be an issue there. It's, it's not, see? It's if you haven't got two people available to do pair programming, we've got three for three or one for mobbing. <laughs> That's just maths. Problems, well. <laughs> <laughs> Small problems because I don't have two people. Well, if you have two people, you need a branch. <laughs> so John and Martin won there, I think. <laughs> I'll set them up in a minute. <laughs> to be fair though, sorry, I'm going to come back to that, because yeah. it, what you're saying is, um, you've got people advocating for a certain good practice, what happens if those people leave the company and the good things that they're saying leave with them? Well, I mean, because that's what you were saying, yeah. people are advocating that branches only last a few days, but then they leave the company and whatever they were saying gets forgotten about. Well, I mean, that's, that's true of anything, you know, that anybody who's advocating for good practices might leave the company, uh, and then whatever they were saying might get forgotten. Well, I mean, actually, the way that, I mean, the, the people who talked about guilds, who talked about teams, the way that teams ought to work is that everybody's talking together about everything, and that everybody's constantly questioning everything that they do. If you have a situation where all the people who are advocating for good stuff leave, and the only people left are inexperienced people who don't know what they're doing, then you've got a problem. You know, and As Martin said, you've now got all the problems. <laughs> the best way you can mitigate against that is for people to be constantly, you know, passing knowledge on to each other, talking to each other, questioning everything they do, and creating that as a culture that they can pass on. Good point. Thank you. Everything you've said so far about branching just seems like a way of, of putting yourself in a, in a bowl to protect against all these external factors and it just seems like it's a way of guarding yourself against a lot of things that are wrong and that if you're having to, to perform a branch so that everybody can understand that this is all one feature, it sounds like there's, there's a lot more problems that will need fixing before, before anything else. I mean, if, if you're doing that because there's a lot of the problems, then maybe, but I think in normal everyday to day practice, you should just be able to stick your last commit on top of whatever else was done, and you should be able to release that bit of code. And if you, the thing that you you shouldn't be sort of working on anything long enough in a day that you can't at least have committed something that is not going to break everything. Yeah, and if you are working on a um, a project that allows that, then absolutely. I think to come back to it, it's it's context, it's experience, the things that I've been working on, the the applications that I've been working with have not allowed me that confidence to be able to develop something that small and deliver something in that short space of time that's actually going to deliver significant business value that I feel comfortable committing and that I'm not going to break everything else. And that's maybe just a, a, um, an aspect of the stuff that I've been working on. We'll take one more question, Andy, because I've it's because there were most of the things that you've asked and apologies. Yeah, yeah, it's my, it's my, it's the scowls. It's, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to channel Kevin. Um, <laughs> the, well done. I'm, 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 I'm still struggling with this as to, as to, to why branching, the, the, the scenarios where branching is not either for developer convenience or because an organisation brokenly thinks that a bunch of people developing stuff at the same time is actually efficient or effective. And this, this is where I'm, you know, I'm really struggling to see a scenario that, as we mentioned, you know, basically it's not trying to, 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 to cover up some other organisation that's functioning. I wonder if there's a specific, you know, is, is there a good scenario that somebody's put forward as to why branching would, would work well in, in, in a context that most people in this room would find not just a complete niche in aerospace or something, but, you know, one that, that would affect most people who are developing commercial businesses. Oh, and no. <laughs> <laughs> would you gentlemen like to make any closing statements? Or would you I have a closing analogy. You can juggle with foam balls or chainsaws, it's up to you. <laughs> Do you have an analogy that fits with branches? Chainsaws <laughs> 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 and branches? Yeah. There you go.
That was it. And befuddled by that. <laughs> Any other one final thing you would like to say before we before we wrap up? I can't top that. <laughs> I think that's what we <laughs> That's okay. All those <laughs> jumped. <laughs> I hope it makes sense to someone. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much to our uh, um, four participants who have fielded some very difficult questions from the, uh, the audience. It's been very enjoyable. <laughs>